I love this church. It's awesome. So, so good. Boy, what a service so far, huh? Man, God is so amazing. Well, listen, um, I'm Pastor Tim Johnson, and your lead pastor, Pastor Jonathan, and his wife are out uh, playing hooky. They just needed a little time to hang out, and so uh, you get me, but um, you get God. Amen? Yeah, thank you. So, so excited what God's going to do, what he's going to impart to you. Well, um, man, it's good to worship God together. Amen. In fact, let me pull out my phone. God, God just, just wanted to emphasize something to me, and I want to reemphasize to you in something we sang. Uh, darkness, your hour is over. Darkness, your hour is over. Amen. Listen, um, I, you know, God has such a gracious way of inviting his people into a place that is safe to say, you know what, today is a day of breakthrough. Today is a day that we can overcome. And uh, I just want to encourage you in that. Would you pray with me as we open up the word of God? Lord, I thank you for this chance just to dive into your word, to understand you better, and to uh, just to walk in faith and victory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, amen and amen. Well, listen, um, coming up, we got a youth bake sale next Sunday, so bring all your goodies that you could help us out with that. Uh, it would be awesome. We want to help kids get to camp. Uh, so youth bake sale next Sunday, that is always uh, a yummy time. Amen? <laughs> Well, I was, um, years and years ago, I um, uh, was driving in a parakeet yellow van, imagine with me, and uh, I was driving down this road uh, with my buddy, and it was 1985. Now, in 1985, the Soviet Union still had its thumb and its grip on the Eastern Bloc countries of, of Europe, and so we were driving from Germany into East Germany on our way to Poland, and um so we're driving down this road, and there's these mounds on both sides of the road. You're sort of coming in. You're funneled in. And on top of those mounds, every 100 yards or so is a guard tower. And on those guard towers were soldiers marching around with machine guns. And we are driving this yellow van, unbeknownst to everybody else except for us. We had hidden in the compartments of this van the Word of God. We had we had tapes for teachers, we had curriculum, we had Bibles, all of that we were going to deliver to a contact that we had, and so we were secretly smuggling Bibles into Eastern Bloc countries, hallelujah for Jesus, it was good. Um, and so we come to the, uh, the, the area where you're sort of, fun, you're sort of shifted, to, you're, you're told where to go. For some reason, we are driving along and we are, we are brought into this line where there's a bunch of lorries. Now, anybody know what that is? A few of you. So... To Americanize that, those are semi-trucks. But in Europe, that's what they call them. So we got, imagine this little yellow parakeet colored van. We're like, you know, I mean, literally there's smoke coming out the tailpipe and, and we're a little bit embarrassed. And here we are in these, these trucks, massive trucks. We get up to the front and uh, the guards are looking at us like, what are you doing here? But they're carrying machine guns. This is in East Germany. And they've got German shepherds because we're in Germany. And so that's what they use. And they're walking around the van, and of course, we're a little bit nervous. Well, probably more than a little bit nervous. And uh, we turn off the van because they're tired of the smoke, and so we're embarrassed. We turn it off, we get out, and I'm, I'm escorted into a, uh, a guard tower, sort of a guard, guard room, rather, and, and uh, I'm nervous, and, and the guard's like, he's doing this number, and I'm like, oh, you could, like, is this a strip search? Like, what's going on? This is, you know, and thankfully, he's like, no, no, I just want to, you know, what's in your pocket? So I'm like, okay. Avoided some awkwardness there, but uh, so I, I took out what was in my pockets, and uh, I, I was pretty nervous. We we finally got uh, we got cued to go, and they just kind of wanted to get rid of us crazy Americans and with their, their terrible van. So we go to start the van, nothing, start the, nothing, not starting. So, but but that was kind of normal. So my buddy jumps out, pops the hood, and uh, carburetor has a car, the carburetor has a little uh, uh, a little little valve thing you can kind of close and. So he closed that, kicked it on, boom, started up, you know, smoke goes, and, and off we go off to Poland. And getting through the Polish border was, is a whole other story for another time. But we made it through, and, uh, and it, was, uh, it was a successful journey. We went to Warsaw and delivered uh, what God gave us to give to the underground church, and it was a, an amazing time. Why do I tell you that story? Because I want to talk about authority. In that moment, I had, I had no authority. Those German soldiers had every authority, all the authority, right? They had the guns, they had the, they had the power, and they had the authority. But I want to tell you, as a believer, you have the authority of Jesus Christ. You have all authority, and, 
As I was just worshiping and praying, my heart just beats for us as believers. And we need to understand the authority that God has given us. And my fear is that as believers, we don't often walk in that authority. Church, we, we, we allow the world to come against us. We allow discouragement to come against us. But I, I'm here to tell you today, and I want to walk you through step by step scripture to implant within your heart so that you understand when you leave here, you are going to be an empowered believer who speaks the name of Jesus over your circumstances, who speaks the name of Jesus over your struggles and your tribulations, that you can walk in authoritative victory. Does that sound good? All right, let's get into this. Amen? Amen. I want to take you through a bunch of scriptures. Uh, and uh, as I was praying, the Holy Spirit told me, he said, you know, when you talk about authority, remind them that it's a gift. That, that God wants to give you the gift of authority. So both to the unbeliever and the believer, maybe to those questioning their faith or even the power of God to move on their behalf. Let's look at scripture and let's discover what God has to say about authority. I want to start with 1 Peter. You're welcome to jump into the Word of God with me, or you can just follow along as I, as I teach. 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 8 and 9. We're, we are going to hit a bunch of Scripture. He says, Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Now catch a couple words here in this next sentence. Resist. Would you say resist? Resist and stand firm in the what? In the faith. Say Resist. And faith, resist and faith, because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of suffering. You're not alone. Peter's saying, look, you're not alone, but you need to resist the enemy and stand firm in your faith. Because when you exercise your faith, you are truly standing firm. You exercise your faith, you're standing firm in the word of God, in the truth of who you are, firm in your authority, and the devil who has lost his power must leave your life and flee. The devil must flee. Diablos, that's the word. One who, one who repeatedly strikes against us and pounds us down to the point where he wants to destroy us and he wants to get in and mess things up. It is literally, the word is, it's a penetrating object to ruin it, to affect it, to take it captive or to ensnare it with a net. You know, life kicks us in the teeth. Life comes against us so often. In fact, Jesus even, thank you, Jesus, but he promised it would happen that way sometimes. There was a moment when Jesus revealed to his followers uh, those people he'd been hanging out with for a long time that he was going to leave. And of course, he would send the comforter to us. He would send the Holy Spirit of truth. But let me read you that moment. Jesus said, behold, an hour is coming and has already come for you to be scattered, each one to his own home and to leave me alone. And yet I'm not alone because the father is with me. These things I have spoken to you that in me, you may have peace. Catch this in the world. You will have what tribulation, but take courage I have overcome the world. What is Jesus saying to his disciples? What is he saying to us? He's, he's having a moment in this relationship where Jesus is saying, look, there's going to be moments in your life when you want to run from this relationship. There's going to be moments in your life where you're not sure about this relationship, and so you're going to kind of, you're going to kind of bug out. You're, you, you're going to question our relationship because you're going to face different kinds of trials. You're going to want to run. Life's not going to look like you expect it to look like, right? Sometimes that happens. But Jesus says when that happens, when travail happens, when tribulations come upon you, when machine gun toting soldiers are pressing against you, when the enemy is pounding down against you, there's a couple things I want you to do. Now, that word tribulation is about as bad as it sounds. It means distress. It means affliction. It means suffering and persecution. But Jesus gives us a couple of responses when life hits us like that. He says two things. Step into my presence. Step into my presence. And then he says, take courage. I believe he would say, take courage through the authority that I've given you. Step into his peace. Both of those points take action on our part. When you face those moments, Jesus is inviting you to step into his peace. That's a, that's a decision we have to make. I'm going to step into that place of peace, and I am going to step up and choose to be courageous. 
He says, take courage, get courageous. Why? He says, because I've overcome the world. Jesus has overcome those tribulations. He said, I am the conqueror. I am the prevailer. I am the victor. I am greater than the world. I am stronger than your impossibility. And I empathize and I understand the turmoil in your heart. And let me enter into that moment. Let me step into that moment. Why? Because I will stand with you and together we will overcome the world. Wow, that, that's the relationship we get to have with Jesus as he is our overcomer. Jesus has conquered the world. Let me give you a scripture, but when we, we talk about the cross, we talk about the death of Jesus and his overcoming of hell and death, he has encouraged us to step with him, to come with him, to take up our own cross and to be overcomers. Jesus has conquered the world. Paul tells us that Jesus transferred that victory to us. Jesus has overcome the world and Paul says he transferred that victory to us in Romans 8, 37. But in all these things, we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. All these things, we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loves us. And I am convinced, I gotta take a deep breath, ready? That neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. Somebody needs to get it this morning. Whatever you face, the power of Jesus within you allows you to be an overcomer. Well, what is it that Jesus has overcome? He says he's overcome the world. What is the world? What is he talking about when he talks about the world? Allow me to frame the battle for you. What is the world? 1 John 2, 15 through 17 says, Do not love the world, there's that word, or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. That's some pretty strong language. For all that is in the world, and here's where he begins to define what the world is and what he has overcome. All that is in the world, the lust, that is the desire, the craving, the longing of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father but is of what? The world. And the world passes away and the lust of it. But he who does the will of God abides forever. John Piper says this in response to that scripture. He says, in other words, the reason you shouldn't love the world is that you can't love the world and God at the same time. Love for the world pushes out love for God. And love for God pushes out love for the world. Somebody needs to hear this morning, this afternoon, to say, you know, I want to love Jesus. I want to love God. I want to fall in love with God so much that the things of this world, I just don't care about it anymore. The lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, Jesus has overcome, and I'm tired of all of that. And I want to be an overcomer. And I want to say, God, would you pour your presence into my life that I may be a person that overcomes when the enemy comes against me. God, would you push out all of that stuff? Would you fill me with your presence so that I have more of you and less and less of this world? Man, I love my wife so much, but she so often says, Tim, I'm just not of this world. Man, this world, there's just nothing here. That is eternal. It's all just temporary. And we clamor and we work so hard and we are driven and we are pulled by the things that we see and the things of this world. And we feel like that's going to give us identity and that's going to like prop us up and life's going to be amazing if I get more of, listen to me, the world. But Jesus says, no, no, no. I want you to have more of me. I want you to have more of me. How much of the world is in your mind, is in your desires, is written out from your checkbook if we still use checkbooks anymore? Whatever you're swiping that tells us a lot about ourselves. Jesus said you cannot serve two masters. The world that Jesus has overcome as a system, it's a culture, it's a way of living that's driven by the flesh and by pride. And I know that the trials of life come at us from a couple of different angles. One, one fact is, is that we live in a fallen world. We just live in a fallen world and, and we, we get sick because there's sickness in the world and, and all of the things of this world affect us. And then there's that internal battle where the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life take root. James further clarifies the battle when he says this, and this is interesting. It really uh, 
Well, listen to this. He says, one is tempted, that is you and I, we are tempted when we are lured and enticed by, listen to this, not the devil, but by our own desires and our own lusts. Then when lust is conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it has run its course, brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my brothers and sisters. Where is the battlefield of your life found? I guarantee it's found in a couple of answers to these questions. What is your flesh fixated on? What is your flesh fixated on? Now, if you're, if you're like new to the believer, uh, to, to, to Christianity, you're like, what's this flesh stuff? That sounds weird. Let me, let me help you with that word, okay? It means selfish desires, your human nature, the things that are contrary to the spirit and the truth of God. The second thing is, is where are your eyes fixed? What are you fixing your eyes upon? Thirdly, where are you prideful? Those are the areas where the enemy is always at work. He's always trying to tear us down. Whatever and wherever that is, that's the world. And that's what Jesus came to overcome in your life. What are you facing that you feel is so difficult to overcome? I brought this hammer up here because the enemy uses, he bludgeons us, he hits us with discouragement, depression, anxiety, worry, anger, control, right? We want to overcome addictions to keep pounding us down. We want to, we want to stop vaping. We want to stop looking at pornography. We want to stop being angry. We want to stop being, trying to be in control of everything. And, and those are all of the things that the enemy wants to use against us. And I'm here to tell you today that God wants to take whatever you write on this, whatever that is, and he wants to turn it around now, I just came from a men's conference, and I feel like I want to just smack the stage. Just, you know, like the, he- the heavenly hammer is going to come down and just destroy the enemy. But I'm going to, don't worry, Pastor, if you're watching this, I won't, I won't tear it up too bad. It's all okay, you know. But a brother reminded me after first service, he said, you know what? God will take those things when you surrender to them, and he will take that hammer, and he will begin to pound down, and he will begin to crush all of the walls and all of the things you need broken down in your life and and removed from your life that the enemy has tried to build up. God is here this morning. Listen, this morning is a unique morning. What God is doing through breakthrough, people praying, right, deliverance, today is a day for you to say, you know what? I'm going to stand up and I'm going to take my authority over the things the enemy's bringing against me. I want to teach you scripturally that that is your right. So why do we struggle? We have such a difficult time overcoming those things. When Paul tells us that we are not only conquerors, but we are overwhelmingly conquerors, I would suggest it's because we don't fully operate in the authority that God has given us. We don't operate in that authority. Name the hammer that pounds you down. What is it for you? What would you write on this if you had a Sharpie and you could walk up here and you could write on that? What is it? I love awkward silence, don't you? So good. Because I want you to think about it. What is it that you've been battling? What it, what's the lie the enemy's been whispering to you? Not enough. You don't have what it takes. Look what you've done. What, what, what is that? If you, could, if you could write it on this hammer, what would it be? Because today I want you to take that, whatever it is, and surrender it to God. I want you to catch this. Identity, who you are in Christ, equals authority. Identity equals authority. Knowing who you are, knowing whose you are, gives you authority in the name of Jesus. God wants to empower you this morning. You need to reclaim your right to rule with godly authority over your life. Here's the big idea. I want you to leave empowered to exercise the God-given authority you have as a follower of Jesus. So I want to talk about authority. I want to talk about the fact that God has it, that Jesus gives it so we get it, right? The devil's lost it. How do we exercise it? Number one, what is authority? So we're talking about authority. What is that? As we unfold the meaning, the giving, and the exercise of authority, keep in mind that we need to understand the term from a biblical perspective. Anybody, uh, anybody into this right here? Our life is founded upon this, right? We live by this the best we can. 
So what does the Bible have to say about it? And and when I talk about authority, right, I'm talking about spiritual authority to resist the enemy. To the Jewish mind, when you'd mention the word authority, they would instantly think of a king. Any sons and daughters of the king this morning in the house? Come on. Yes. Amen. We would think about the king. To To the Greek, they would think of the word exousia. It's a word that refers to the invisible legal power of God, the power to act. It refers to the ability to perform an action legally. So let me give you a definition of authority. Authority is the God-given permission to use God's name and power as the Holy Spirit directs. Our authority is the God-given. God has given you permission to use his name and his power as the Holy Spirit leads you and directs you. All right, so let me give you some examples of exousia, this word authority in Scripture. Mark chapter 6, 7 says, And he summoned the twelve and began to send them out in pairs and gave them, here we go, authority over unclean spirits. Luke chapter 4 says, And amazement came upon them all, and they began talking with one another, saying, What is this message? For with authority and power he commands the unclean spirits, and they come out. Colossians 2.10 says, And in him you have been made complete, and he is the head over all rule and authority. So when we talk about the authority of the believer, we are asking, uh, excuse me, we're talking about the exercise of God's authority, God's legal power, the God-given permission to use God's name and power as the Holy Spirit directs. God has it. He created it. In Genesis, remember, we go all the way back, Genesis, God created Adam and Eve in his image, and he gave them dominion or power or authority over all the earth to subdue it. Daniel shares his revelation of the power and supremacy of God when he says this, Praise be to the name of God forever and ever. Listen, wisdom and power are his. Just in case, you need to be reminded that all wisdom and all power are from God. Amen? He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to the discerning. Earlier, I skipped this. He says he changes times and seasons. He deposes kings and raises up others. Aren't you glad God's in control? (laughs) Aren't you glad that God is the one that raises up and God's the one that brings down and God's the one that walks us through all the crazy in our country and in our world? What's the New Testament have to say? Well, Jesus says, which is easier to say your sins are forgiven or to say get up and walk, but I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the paralyzed man, get up, take your mat, and go home. And when the man got up and went home, the crowd saw this, and they were filled with awe, and they praised God who had given such authority to man. One more for you from Matthew. All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples Of all nations, Jesus has been given the authority from his Father. God has authority. God defined authority. God gave that authority to Jesus. Now get ready because Jesus gives that authority to you. Jesus is going to give you the authority of the creator of the universe for you to use the name of Jesus to overcome anything that comes against you. The problem is, as believers, I wonder if we believe that. Do we use the name of Jesus as he leads us and guides us? So Jesus gives it to us. We just read that Jesus gave the apostles authority. Luke 9 says this, when Jesus had called the 12 together, he gave them power and authority to drive out all demons and cure diseases and sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. Jesus has given you power and authority, now listen to this, to drive out all demons, to cure disease, to proclaim the gospel, and to heal the sick. God wants to activate his church to walk in that kind of power. Can you imagine? Can you, would you believe what our community would look like? That believers would, would stand and say, you know, I'm standing in the name of Jesus, and at every Name will bow to the name of Jesus, the name of sickness and disease and discouragement. Wherever you go, you are a light of Jesus to the people around you. You are walking in authority in your home, in your marriage, in your church, in your community. Jesus wants his people to move and exercise that authority. Well, some people might say the naysayers, well, you know, it was 
those first original 12, right, that had that authority and, and you know, they, they passed on and so we kind of lost that. No, 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 no. There's something about Jesus saying, go and make disciples and teach them all that I taught you and all that I commanded you. Right, so they did that. In fact, another part of scripture says, and the 70 returned, right, glorifying God, even in saying, even the devils are subject to us through your name. 70 returned. So, okay, we went from 12, now we're to 70. I'm just trying to lay it out for you. Scripturally, you know, it didn't end in the New Testament church, right? It is for us today. I want to encourage you in that. In fact, the scripture says that that even the devils are subject to us. That's an interesting word. The enemy is subject to you. Catch that. He's subject to you. What does that mean? It's a military term. It portrays a soldier who falls in line when a commander gives an order, one who is submitted to authority. So the disciples came back and they're like, Lord, when we speak, they recognize our voices as voices of commanders and they fall in line. I mean, somebody needs to stand up in your, your, your life and say, you know what? I'm going to speak as a commander and as a voice of God in my life. And all that is coming against me needs to fall in line. Like, devil, fall in line. In fact, not only, I'm just going to kick you all the way to the curb. Like, get out of my life. Get out of my life, out of my family, out of my mind. You can walk in such a way where the enemy will submit to your words that are given to you through the name of Jesus. Here's the principle we miss In doing that, you need to be submitted to God so the devils can be submitted to you. You need to be submitted to God so the devils can be submitted to you. You need to say, God, I surrender. I submit myself to you. I give up control. I give up trying to figure it out. I give up all. I'm submitted to you. And the moment you are submitted to him and you're standing at the foot of the cross and you're saying, Jesus, I'm standing in this place where you overcame death and hell. I'm going to stand in that power. And by faith, I'm going to speak of my circumstances. I'm going to speak in my circumstances and say, you know what? No more. The hour of darkness is over. It is overcome. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. James 4, 7, submit yourselves to God. What is the result? When you're submitted to God, you are empowered, you are authorized, and the devil has to flee from you. In Jesus' name. Yeah, we can give a clap to that. That's probably a good place to. What name on this hammer needs to be submitted to God, needs to be given to God? What's the situation you need to take authority over? Because I'm convinced that there's some of us here today that need to stand eventually in this, in this service, say, you know, I'm going to stand. I'm going to take authority. I'm going to take authority I don't see how this is going to change or how this is going to happen, but in Jesus' name, I'm going to take authority. Luke 10, 19, let me read this to you. Listen, I've given you authority. That's you, and that's me. I've given you authority so that you can walk on snakes and scorpions. Now, please don't, like, literally do that, okay? I mean, I, we are in the South, but, you know, those are, those are representations of the enemy, right? Don't walk on snakes and scorpions. You will be able to walk on them. Oh, and and overcome all the power of the enemy and nothing will hurt you. All the power of the enemy. Listen, child of God, Jesus has given you authority to overcome all the power of the enemy. Not some of it, not part of it, all of it. All of it. We're submitted to the name of Jesus because at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess. Listen to me, your life should be a reflection of of your authority. Your life should be a reflection of your authority. Who are you in Jesus? Who are you in Jesus? Be a reflection of that authority. And these signs shall follow them that believe in my name. They shall cast out devils and speak with new tongues. Peter said, look, silver and gold, I don't have all that, but what I do have, I give to you in the name of Jesus. Stand up and walk. Man, I hope it's becoming obvious to you that as a believer, you have been given authority. You've been given power. And God wants to release that in you. So God's got it. Jesus gives it. Now you got it. And guess what? The devil lost it. Now this is where it gets really good. Because the devil lost it. All right. So I want to show you that you can be empowered. I want to encourage you. Why do I tell you that to exercise the power of Jesus over the enemy You have to be living under the power of the cross. Remember I referenced that, like I want to get at the foot of the cross. Why is that? 
Because Hebrews 2.14 reminds us that through death, that is the cross, he might render powerless him who had the power of death. That is the devil. Jesus upon the cross, listen to me, rendered the power of the enemy absolutely null and void. That word powerless is to cause to come to an end, to cause to become nothing, to put an end to, to wipe out, to invalidate. Do you believe in the power of the cross? Do you believe in the power of the cross? I'm asking you, do you believe in the power of the cross? Because when you believe in the power of the cross, the devil ain't got nothing. The devil's been invalidated. The devil has no power over your life. The devil is illegitimate. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil, 1 John 3, 8. Not to diminish, not to cut in half, not to curtail, but to destroy. The power of the cross utterly and completely disarms and destroys the devil. He has no power for the believer who is living under the shed blood of Jesus Christ. No power in your life. The only power the devil has is the power that we give him and the deception we believe. It's kind of on us. You have to give him power in your life. You have to open the door of sin. You begin to walk in sin. And when you do that, you are driving or giving the devil a legal permission to bring death through the door when we sin, when we walk in sin. How can I say that? Listen to this, Genesis 4, 7. It's interesting. God speaking, says, if you do good, will you not be lifted up? If you do not do good, sin is crouching at the door. It has a strong desire for you, but you must rule over it. You must take authority over it. Sin is crouching at the door, and it's eager. I'm telling you, it's eager. The enemy is eager. And we talk about opening doors of influence of the enemy. What you let through your eyes, what you let into your heart, what you process in your mind, right? We walk in this world, and this world is a constant barrage of all kinds of things. And I want to tell you, be careful. Do not open doors to sin and the enemy. Because the moment you do that, right, the enemy comes in. And Scripture tells us that the result is death. Those doors of sin, we got to close them. This morning, close them. Whatever that look, you got to close it. You got to close the window. You got to close the door. Romans walks us through an amazing kingdom principle that I want you to get a hold of. I'm going to read a chunk of scripture. In fact, if you want to return to Romans 8, you're welcome to do that. This is Romans 8, verses 5 through 9. Bear with me because I just, I just want you to get a biblical understanding. I hope this is beginning to stir something in your heart where you're like, you know what? I'm rising up. I'm not backing down. The enemy has no power in my life. What what have I been thinking? Letting him in, whisper, and doing all this stuff. For those who live according to the flesh, right? That's, That's one of those things of the world. Set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit set their minds where? On the things of the Spirit. It's setting our mind. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. There's that life and peace. Jesus is inviting us to step into life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. There's like no way. It just can't do that. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if in fact the spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ does not belong to him. It's a process of the mind. The battle is in the mind, isn't it? Set your mind, set your heart on the things of the Spirit, and the kingdom law says that that results in life and peace. The other kingdom law says if you set your mind on the things of the flesh, what's going to result? Death, things of death. You've opened the door, sin's crouching, it's pounced, it's got you. You can't set your mind on the things of the lust of the flesh, the pride of life, all of that, the world. Now, I want two scriptures for you to look at two scriptures. We're going to look at Colossians 2. I'm going to read this for you in Ephesians 6. In Colossians 2, he says this, He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them. And then he goes on, and we see this in, in Ephesians 6. The Word of God says, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers and against authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. When you compare Colossians 2 
with Ephesians 6, we see that the thrones and dominions and rulers and authorities are clearly spiritual powers, they're spiritual entities, and the wicked forces of this world. These entities are those whom Jesus has defeated and those who we have exousia over. So Jesus said he has stripped, he has disarmed, and he has triumphed. What does that mean? He's stripped, he's disarmed, like he's disarmed the enemy. So imagine a, a general back in the day, right, when the Romans were ruling and they would overtake and they would, they would beat out an army, they would bring that general who was, guess what, regaled with everything that says this guy has authority, this is the general, this is the big dog, he's got all the stuff that says this is who he is. And Jesus says, look, when I came face to face with the enemy on the cross, I stripped him of every insignia and every rank. He has no power. Not only that, he says, I am going to triumphantly show you. It's like, it's like in their mind, they would have imagined this triumphal procession where the Romans would have marched the conquered general through the streets, declaring to that community, look, this general has no power anymore. He has no armor anymore. He has no rank anymore. You don't have anything to be worried about. And Jesus literally, through Paul, tells us that he triumphed over the enemy. He triumphed over the enemy. So, so good. So you might be thinking, well, you're telling me the enemy has no power, but man, I'm looking at the world and it's a mess. That's right, it's a mess. So the enemy has no power over you, but the enemy has power in this world. So we look at the foolishness that we see around this world and we know that evil and that power can only manifest itself in the spheres of this world where the exercise of the power and presence of Jesus is absent. The evil and that power that the evil one has can only be manifest and used where there is the absence of the power of Jesus. God allows the perpetuation of evil only because he has allowed mankind to exercise free will. The result of mankind's fallen nature is selfish ambition. It's greed. It's the rejection of God's order. It's what Romans 8 tells us. It is the mindset on the flesh, which equals death. As believers, the enemy has no power. He has no authority. Where the cross is, the enemy is defeated. Where the cross is, the enemy is defeated. God's got it. Jesus gives it. You got it. The devil lost. And I've got two minutes and 41 seconds to tell you how to use it. I'll probably take a little more than that. What is it in your life you need to take authority over? Ephesians reminds us that to the believer, the enemy has no real power, only trickery and deception and schemes. That's why we need discernment. We need the Holy Spirit living within us. First John says this, for everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. You need to walk in your faith. You need to walk in faith, faith that Jesus has given you. If the power of this world is ruling over your heart and your relationships and your mind, you need to make a power shift and get back under the authority of God so that he can release his power and authority to you. If you're saying world first, you can't say God first because you're authorizing the powers of this world to rule your heart and your mind if you say world first. Romans 12 says they have conquered him by the blood of, excuse me, Revelations 12, 11 says they have conquered him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. The word of their testimony. Matthew says, truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. That binding and loosing church is something you've been empowered to do to the Jewish mind in the Mishnaic phrase that is used there. It's to bind and to loose. It simply means to forbid by an indisputable authority and be permitted by an indisputable authority. That's what that means. You have the power to bind the enemy, to tie him up, to kick him out of your life. You have an indisputable authority. You have a God-empowered authority. You have a blood-bought authority. You have a heavenly right to stand up and say, you know what, enough is enough enemy in my life. Get off my kids, get out of my marriage, get out of my workplace, get out of my mind, get those whispers out of my head. In Jesus' name, I command you to leave my life. In Jesus' name, Jesus' name. 
Jesus came to destroy the works of the enemy and you're commissioned to be a destroyer of the works of the enemy to cut his power off of your life. From the days of John the Baptist until now, men are forcefully pressing into the kingdom of heaven and eager men pursue it and grab hold of it and forcefully claim it. I'm gonna ask you to do something in a minute, but I really only want you to do this if, if, if you're really ready. What, what's, what's the enemy you've been pounding you with? What's he been lying to you about? Where does he have you trapped? What thought is tormenting you? What worry has frozen you with anxiety? What sickness is holding you down? What addiction has held you in shame? What anger is draining your strength and damaging your relationships? What confusion has the devil brought into your mind? What lies are you believing? What label is on that hammer of the enemy? Tony Evans says, kingdom prayer is divinely authorized access for heaven to invade earth. Is there an area, is there a situation, is there a battle you're in? I want you to right now, church, if that's you, I'm gonna ask you to rise up with a shield of faith right now, right now. If that's you, if you're like, I'm ready to take authority over a situation in my life, I want you to stand up right now. I'm asking you to rise up with a sword of the spirit. I'm asking you to stand and stand therefore against the enemy. I'm asking you to take hold of the power of God and declare the name of Jesus over your life, over your circumstance, over the impossibility, over the lies of the enemy. If that's you, I want you to stand up and we're gonna worship together. I'm gonna ask the prayer team to come down to the front. Right now, prayer team, come up. We're gonna make some declarations, church. And you're gonna follow this. We're gonna make declarations on the screen back there. And an uh, awesome uh, screen person in the back is gonna help me out. Well, we're gonna make some declarations, all right? What you see up there, I want us all to read together and believe together. Ready? On three, one, two, three. Jesus has given me authority to overcome all evil. In Jesus' name. I bind the work of whatever that is, right? In Jesus' name, I bind the work of anger, confusion, discouragement, you name it. And I loose the truth of God over it. Today, I take hold of that authority. I bind the lies of the devil. Today, I am resisting and standing firm in my faith. And the devil must flee. I take every thought captive and submit them to the authority of Christ. I am spiritually alive. And I have been set free from the fear of death. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. God is for me. And it doesn't matter what stands against me. No weapon, church. No weapon, church. No weapon formed against me will prosper. And every tongue raised against me in judgment, God will condemn. This is my heritage as a son and daughter of the king. I bind what the enemy meant for my destruction. I loose what God has prepared for my victory. In the name of Jesus and in the power of his cross, I take hold of hope. I take hold of freedom. Nothing, church, nothing shall separate me from the love of God in Christ Jesus. I choose life and life in abundance. Lastly, today I stand. Today, I walk in authority. Today, I take back what the enemy has stolen. Today, I am victorious. Give a clap to the Lord, church. Hallelujah. Yes, God. Yes, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If you need prayer, I want you to come down. If you stood up, I want you to come down. Make a choice to come against the enemy. Walk in that authority, church. If you need to come down, be obedient. Come down, get prayer. Stand with people who believe in you and who love you. Hallelujah. We are overcomers. Let's sing together.